thanks everybody for for being here. Um, I'm very happy to introduce you Peter Dayan. Uh, Peter studied mathematics uh, in the UK and then uh, he was in uh, uh, Canada for a little bit and then at MIT and then moved back to London uh, to co-found the Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Institute at UCL. I'm very happy to have him here, although he's not physically here. Um, Peter will try to interact even despite you not being here. So uh, please, everybody, let's interrupt Peter, although he's not here. Uh, he probably won't hear you, so I can repeat your questions or I can give you the microphones. Peter, be, be <laughs> warned that uh, we'll interrupt. So um, yeah, thanks very much and uh, let's start. Okay, thank you very much indeed for the invitation. I'm really sorry not to be able to be with you. It'd be lovely to be in the, to, to come and visit uh, another time, I hope. And uh, please do indeed interrupt me as, as I go. So the work I'm going to talk about has been done primarily by Chris Gagney, who was a postdoc in my lab in, in Tubing and is now in New York, and also a, um, a, uh, a research assistant that we share called Yannick uh, Stryker. So I'd like to imagine you in the following uh, problem. Here, you're this agent, this rather strange agent, and uh, your aim, your goal is to try and get to this uh, dual chest with which you get uh, plus five units of, uh, of money. And your, but your actions are a bit uh, variable, which means that uh, to with 12.5% probability, you don't go in the correct direction. So you want to go right, let's say, but then you, know, you might have a probability of going down. And then we have what uh, Chris loves to call these lava pits. So these are uh, these places of doom where you get gobbled up and you lose uh, 10 points. And every step costs you 0.1 uh, points. Now, if I could see you, I'd ask you to raise your hands and ask you to choose which path you would go. There are sort of three obvious paths. There's the direct path like this. There's a sort of medium, and that's a bit risky because you keep on going near to the horrible lava pits. There's this medium path like this which goes only past these lava pits and just a little bit this one. And there's a really low risk path that goes like this all the way around here. So um, as I said, I can't see you uh, raise your hands as to which one you've done, but I will show you that in a, some pilot data from my own lab, we're just collecting some real experimental data. We saw this very nice sort of distribution where it's almost a third, a third, a third, where some people were with these risk, uh, more risk taking people, other people uh, uh, went around this medium uh, route, maybe four of those, and then three people went up like this. So it's really an interesting task in which you think, well, okay, well, what am I, you know, what are you trying to optimize? What are you trying to, to satisfy here? And the fact that we see these big differences between people, we think is actually quite important, even for things like a psychiatric uh, viewpoint. Um, here's another example, which might be, uh, also speak to risk uh, seeking or risk, uh, risk aversion. This is for some data from um, uh, um, Mitsuko Watabe Yoshida's lab, where they had a, um, a mouse in a, in a room and so for two days, for about 25 minutes, you know, they had a session a day. They just, there was nothing in this room. They just could just run around. And then they put in just a novel object. So nothing, you know, there's, no, the object didn't provide them with any, any return or any danger itself. And they just looked to see what happened to the trajectories of the mouse, of the mice that they put in over the next four days of, uh, of novelty seeking. And what you can see here, so what they've done here is sorted them by animal. This is H1, uh, the, the, the habituation days followed by the novelty days. And they're here, they're showing you the time that the animal is spending near to the object. And they have some quite uh, elaborate things to work out what that means. And what I want you to observe is that there's a big difference in the time between these different animals. So these animals here basically almost never get really near to the object. Whereas these, these animals are the last, you know, as I said, they're sorted by how much time they spend. These ones very rapidly start to spend quite a bit of time near the object. And in the end, they, they, they stop, it doesn't give you anything. And what uh, they, um, what uh, Mitsuko did was to distinguish approach with the tail behind, which they consider to be a cautious approach or approach when the animal actually puts its tail exposed to it, which is a confident approach. And you, again, you see these same animals here, the same sorting. They never approach the object in this confident way. So we see these huge individual differences, even just between mice from the same strain, essentially, just like we saw these individual differences between uh, uh, students from the same from the same lab. Would I to understand a bit Peter, about what we mean? Yeah. Peter, excuse me. What is the object? The object is just a just a novel object, it's like a little Lego tower. There's nothing. It doesn't give okay, you any. Nothing interesting about it. Okay. 
it's in, well, it's interesting to the mice. You know, of course, it's a novelty. It might have some danger. Maybe that's why these ones are so cautious. It might have some reward. You know, it also has cure. You know, the animals are curious in this environment. So this is just an interesting case where the animals, you know, they they face a, essentially an approach avoidance conflict. They want to approach for curiosity and because it might have a reward. And obviously, they're worried about the about the, the possibility of a catastrophe if it uh, bites them or shocks them or something. You see this, this, and again, what I'm really stressing here is these individual differences that we can see. Good, please do, as I say, do carry on asking questions. Okay, so what's the plan for this talk for 45 minutes? So I want to talk a bit about risk aversion as a whole, and then I'll tell you about some work we've done about risk aversion in sequential domains, like these domains that we're, that, that, that we're, seeing, that we're seeing here, like the, the lava pit domain, and talk about two different versions of risk aversion in that case, or risk assessment, um, which are versions of something called a conditional value at risk, which is a measure that we stole from the finance community. Um, and we'll talk about you know, there's a pre-committed version and a nested version. I'll tell you why, how they come about. And then we'll talk, show you some risk-averse online behavior. I already showed you what that looks like in our domain and say how that might come about. And then also, and then this is the rehearsal aspect, talk about risk-averse offline planning. So here we imagine that uh, humans and animals are spending time when they're not actually behaving in the world designing policies that will give them a good, will do a good job if you then put them in the environment. And then um, if their environment contains risk, like the lava pits, then we want to see what's different as a function of your risks, um, your risk appetite in terms of what it is that you're thinking about, what it is you might be in some way ruminating about. Um, and the context of this really is this field of computational, uh, computational psychiatry, which is a you know, like a nascent field trying to use our understanding of what of decisions and what can go wrong with them to make progress in understanding nosology. So the way we divide out psychiatric disease and even to think about things like prediction. And one thing that one one way that I like to split up the, the issues that come up when you think about essentially what amounts to bad quality decisions. Is you can think of this here. This is the essentially this is a um, somebody who's correctly uh, you hear this, this essentially this. The, the spirit is weak, but the flesh is willing, in the sense that here, they have a system which is correctly solving what amounts to a problem which is incorrect. So you might think of somebody who has a really, really risk sensitive, much more so than other people. That means that they correctly will then change their behavior relative to, to, to other people, or indeed perhaps to relative to themselves at other times. Um, and therefore, for instance, be very uh, you know, highly risk avoidant and perhaps never go out, never, never, never leave the home. Another way you could have it is what you might think of as the, uh, the um, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So here you're trying to solve the right problem. You might have a correct way of assessing risk, but maybe your correct way of evaluating risk, but maybe the way that you then react to it or calculate it might be incorrect. And that would lead to very different sorts of errors or very different sorts of behavior you might see. Um, of course, you could have the, the flesh could be weak and the spirit is weak. That's uh, Boris Johnson, Brexit. Um, but more importantly, it could also be the, what we think of as being the wrong environment. So here we have the case that you're trying to solve the right problem with the right means, but the way that you've adapted to an environment is, um, is not fit to the current nature of the environment. So imagine, for instance, you, you, know, you um, consider evaluating risk or return in a very barren environment like this, like a, like a desert. But then, um, uh, then the, since then, the environment has changed, and now you have this lush rainforest. But if you set your parameters for whether you're willing to explore based on the risks of the desert, you might not go out and explore and realize that the world has changed, and now it affords all these better opportunities. And so this path dependence is, I think, a very strong determiner of some aspects of behavior in, the psychiatric, in a psychiatric context. OK, so what sort of risk measure should we use? Well, a very, uh, there are many risk measures that we could uh, we could imagine that come from different different communities in a way. But one particularly interesting one, which comes to the finance, and this is maybe really good for animals as well, is a risk measure which focuses on the worst sorts of things that can happen, the lower tail of the distribution. So here, if you have a distribution of possible returns, risk measures that worry about catastrophes, you know, this what's happening this this lower tail are particularly interesting for animals, for instance, trying to survive predation. You can see them obviously why they might be valuable in the insurance industry, but also in medicine and also in engineering too. And so a particularly convenient measure which, has, which satisfies some nice axiomatic properties is called the conditional value at risk. So 
here, what we do is we take the whole distribution that you have, and then we worry about different about uh, about the average values in particular quantiles. So the average, so if we have the full average case, that means we take the whole distribution and evaluate its average. That's just the completely regular mean. But then what the what the value at risk is, this var, is just the lower, let's say, 30% quantile. So here, the alpha value here is 0.3. That means we take just the bottom 30% of this distribution. And then the value at risk is the number on this axis, which is associated with that bottom 30%. So it turns out that the value at risk doesn't satisfy appropriate axioms as a good quality risk measure. But what does is the average value in that bottom 30%. And that's called the conditional value at risk, or CVAR. This alpha is 0.3. So here, this value here is just the average value in that, in that bottom 30%. And as you might imagine, we can then, you know, change, as we change alpha from being 1 towards being 0, we're focusing our attention on lower and lower quantiles of this distribution. So 0.6, 0.3, 0.1, and 0.05. And then the average value then gets lower and lower as we, as we move into that, into that quantile. And so formally, the CVAR is the expected value of a random variable, which is, the, which, is, which is conditioned on the fact you're in this lower quantile. And there are various ways one could calculate it. A sort of dual way of thinking about this, uh, you can do that also if you have um, atoms. So uh, uh, that's, this, this, the, that's the version if you have atoms in the distribution, it's the fuller version. Another way of thinking about this, which relates to things like prospect theory, which is another way of thinking about risk in finance, is, and in psychology, is to take the whole distribution of returns and say that what we're really doing is we're allowed to boost probabilities of these outcomes. So here, each, this is the probability of the outcome. And then when we think about a, um, a risk measure of the alpha is 0.3, it means we're allowed to boost any probability by one over 0.3, so it's three and a third in this case. And what we do is we focus that um, on all the lowest probability items. So that 0.05 becomes 0.16 and so forth. And we march up the distribution until we run out of probability mass. So we're allowed a re-weighting, that's this psi term here, and we're only allowed to re-weight by a certain maximum, that's the alpha, uh, one over alpha, and then we do it until we run out of road, essentially. And again, that turns out to be completely equivalent to this way of thinking about CVAR, but it's more convenient for some sorts of calculations. Um, and that you could write that this way, where this is the you know, we, this is the multiplication, the maximum multiplication here is by one over alpha, but we still have to have a good quality distribution. And then we try to minimize, it's like a minimax problem, actually, you can think of it like that. Okay, so just to sum up on CVAR, it's a coherent risk measure, that's the axiomatic property that we like. It emphasizes the lower tail. If alpha is one, we're in the regular mean case. As alpha tends to zero, we focus on the absolute worst thing that can happen. We'll see that that has a really particularly bad properties in some cases. And we have this equivalence of distorting the probabilities where the distortions favor nasty things that can happen, so the bad outcomes that might, might arise. But in the case of uh, things like the lava pit, or indeed also we, we can argue the, the mice, we are in a sequential decision-making problem. We're not making one choice, we're making a sequence of choices. And in this instance, you get some really interesting properties to these risk measures. So imagine we're in a very simple domain in which there's a stock state here, and there are two possible outcomes, a sort of bad outcome and a good outcome. And this is the distribution of returns you see in the bad outcome. So here, they're all around uh, minus two or the good outcome, they're around, the, you know, around plus two. And the probability of getting this bad outcome is 0.1, and the probability of getting the good outcome is 0.9. This is a contrived problem. So from the perspective of the start state, then the overall distribution of outcomes looks like this, where this is you know, weighted by 0.1, this is weighted by 0.9, and here are, the, here are all the outcomes. So if you were to care about the bottom 10% of outcomes, that's what CVAR 0.1 does, and alpha is 0.1, then it should only care about these lower outcomes here, these lower outcomes here too. So the, this, is, um, this version of CVAR says we should compute the average value in these low outcomes. But if you think about this in terms of what I described, which is we do this re-weighting of probabilities, then what you think of is, uh, sorry, apologize for this. Like that. Um, if you think about this re-weighting of probabilities, we're going to re-weight this guy. If it's alpha is 0 0.1, our maximum re-weighting is, is, is by uh, 1 over 1.1 is by 10. And that means that none, and the, so none of these terms are going to get any re-weighting. And these ones are going to be maximally re-weighted, such that every single one of them uh, you know, is, 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 is boosted. 
Um, and that means that these outcomes are not going to contribute at all to the CVAR 0.1, as they shouldn't do, because they're just not part of this bottom 10% of outcomes. However, if we've been unlucky, if you like, and gotten to this bad outcome uh, here, now to calculate the CVAR correctly from the perspective of the start state, we now have to include every single possible outcome that can come in this, in this, in this term here. So now we don't only focus on the bottom 10% of things that happen when you have this bad outcome. Instead, we have to focus on the entire uh, collection of outcomes here. So we have to change the value of alpha associated with the fact that we've essentially already been unlucky. And so you can think of this as being like a sort of justified gambler's fallacy in the sense that you know, something bad has already happened, then you know, you've consumed your, uh, your bad luck already up to this point, and now you can expect to be risk neutral from there on. So this we call PC bar, because you're pre-committing to the, uh, the value of the, of the, um, to the risk measure that you have right at the beginning of this, um, of this sequence, which is right at the beginning of when you're at step S. Um, so formally, what we're doing is we're computing the CVAR on the full return. So here, let's like, say a discounted return. So the, the first reward plus gamma times the second reward plus gamma squared and so forth. And we're essentially privileging a start state or a home or a nest. And then we have this gambler's fallacy, which you know, if we've been unlucky, then alpha should increase because it means that um, we can now be a bit more risk seeking. And if we've been lucky, that means we've already, that means we have really nasty things to happen in the future in order to hit this target quantile for alpha. And that means that alpha is going to have to decrease again as well. And alpha equals zero, where you only care about the lowest, the worst possible outcome, that's special. Once, you're, once alpha is zero, you never have to reweight anything. And alpha equals one is also special for the same reason. That's when you look at the whole distribution. Again, you just carry on. You never reweight that whole distribution. Um, and we can do it either by, you know, because we have to reweight, we have to remember what's happened. So we can either do it by a history dependent evaluation, or more conveniently, is we actually have to solve a two dimensional problem, or like a where you are in the world, that is your state, like are you in the B or the G outcome, or where are you in the lava pit? Um, or we add, the, uh, but then we have another dimension, which is the alpha dimension, which is our current risk seekingness or risk avoidance, essentially. Okay, so let's think about this in a very simple random walk, where here we have a reward of two at this location, a reward of one at this location, and we have a lava pit um, with worth minus 10. And we're going to start off with a policy which is just equally often going left and right uh, or staying where you are. So it's a third, a third, a third. But we have, again, incompetent actions where uh, no matter what you do, there's in this instance, I think, a 10% probability of going the wrong way. Well, that'll become important later. It's not important now because you're just going every way evenly anyway. And then this for gamma is 0.9 turns out to be the distribution of discounted returns that you would get. That's just, you know, just by evaluating on this random walk when you start at this location. So now what we're going to do is think about, well, how do we evaluate states when we um, use different values of alpha? So here's what the value looks like, the average value, so the CVAR value looks, for alpha equals one. So that's just the same as the actual average value. And I'm showing that on a scale which goes from red, really negative, um, to green, really positive. And you can see that the, you know, this, the, the location on the right is, is, is the reward here is you know, it's fairly green because you get to consume some of that reward. But these values here get to be increasingly negative because you get gobbled up by the lava pit. And alpha equals zero, you only care about the worst case. And what I'm showing you here is that even these gray arrows say that when you do this probabilistic reweighting, you say, well, what's the place that I'm likely, that I believe I'm, got, I'm going to end up at? So even though I try, in some sense, my actions with equal probability at each of these states, the system says, well, I'm going to reweight all your actions, all the outcomes, as being the worst possible thing that can happen because alpha is zero. And in this instance, obviously, the worst possible thing is that you go left and left and left and left until you inexorably run into the lava pit. And so these values are all highly negative, and that's the measure of the effect of the risk nature. So you're thinking about the risk uh, the CVAR value, and those CVAR values are highly negative in this case, even though the average values are, are not so bad. And as we then think, be, you know, we then interpolate between this, um, this value zero and this value one, you can see that the values become a bit more, um, you know, a bit more optimistic. But again, you still see this effect of revaluation, where now 
Um, as I mentioned, if you're unlucky, that means going left in this instance, then you tend to de you tend to increase the value of alpha. So that means you become a bit more risk neutral. And if you're luck, if you're lucky, which means moving right, so now you move down towards a more risk averse aspect of alpha. We can fill in the whole table like this, where now you can see uh, um, the, uh, the uh, as you become more and more risk neutral, then values on the right, for instance, become better and better because you actually expect to be able to you know, stay there. You're not worried about the always, you know, the excess property or always going um, left and left. Then what you can do is say, well, what happens if I get to optimize my policy? Right, I'd like to optimize my policy, but now where I'm optimizing it to 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 optimize C var at a given value of alpha, a starting value of alpha. Remember, I told you it depends where you begin. Um, in, in general, then now what do the values look like and what's the policy like? So here, if alpha is equal to one, in this problem, it means that you, what you do at the start state is to go left. So here's the start state, you go left because it's worth your while trying to exploit this excess reward here as opposed to going right. But of course, you could still run into the lava pit. But then here, at this location, you try to stay where you are to get the reward. But of course, there's still you know, this 10% probability of doing an incorrect action altogether. At alpha equals zero, uh, it, it doesn't matter what you try to do because there's no, you have no capacity to affect the outcome in a stochastic world. That's to say that in the CVAR world, you worry always about the worst possible thing. So since there's some probability that you go left, the CVAR zero always thinks you're always going to consume this worst possible outcome. And so therefore, you, you wait, then therefore, these values here are just the same as these values here. There's nothing you can mitigate it. So in psychiatry, this would be considered to be a form of learned helplessness in the sense that your actions in your mind don't have any agency. So even though they really do have agency in the world, here, because you're worried about this maximum value of risk, this, this, uh, this most extreme sort of risk sensitivity, you sort of believe to yourself that the actions don't have any agency, and therefore you just always think the worst thing that could happen is going to happen. And then in the middle, now, we're, uh, as I've mentioned, we're starting here from this, the, our start state is this uh, 0.3 value here. And you can see that now, again, you actually do, you, know, you obviously do better than you do from just a uniform policy. But nevertheless, if you start at that value of risk sensitivity, then it's actually optimum. Instead of going left, as you do if you're risk neutral, it's optimum to go right here in order to try and get this reward because you're worried about the, about, about the outcome. So this tells us how it is that risk in this sequential domain is going to affect the behavior that you see. And in fact, if we come back to our, lava, our horrible lava pits here, the, this being the, um, the choices that our subjects made, we designed this, this um, environment such that um, we could look at three different values, uh, that the three different paths would be associated with different values of alpha. So if alpha is one, which means that you're risk neutral, then it turns out that the optimum path to try and follow is this path that goes directly to the goal, the shortest path to the goal. If alpha is around 0.5, then the best, the optimum thing to do is to go um, on this path, you take the medium length path. And if you're really risk averse, alpha is 0.0, 0.0, no, around 0.14, 0.15, then you take this really long path around to the goal. So what we're doing now, as you might imagine, is giving this uh, these in, a series of environments like this to individuals to see if we can understand their, their practical risk sensitivity in this, even in this very simple domain, and then see if it's coherent across these different, um, these different tasks. OK. So let's come back to um, this PC bar, where what we do is, as I mentioned, um, are, as a result of being unlucky in this case, this um, having gone, gone down this path to the bad outcomes, we now imagine changing alpha so that then we, are, we have to incorporate all these values of possible outcomes to, in order to evaluate the PC bar from the perspective of the start state. There's another coherent way to proceed in which we always, every time we go to another state, again, we always just think about the bottom 10%, which means that now here, we, when we're re waiting, we're focusing on the bottom 10% of this distribution itself. And so from the perspective of the start state, we're just looking at this teeny tiny little 1% you know, uh, fraction of these. And so this we call nested CVAR. So because you're sort of nesting the possibility of going, you know, every time you go, you get another um, nasty outcome. And another, you're always looking at the worst possible things that can happen in these worst possible cases. As in, as, as, and as you can imagine, this is a far more risk-averse way of behaving 
because you keep on narrowing down your options and you think it gets worse and worse. So if we come back to this, uh, to our random walk, and we look at n c var in this random walk here. So here, these were the same p c var values I told you before, where we have this even policy going each way, you know, a third, a third, a third. If we look at the n c var, we can now ask what happens here. Well, again, for the uniform policy, as for alpha equals one, I'm sorry, then the values don't change, right? It's just there's no there's no risk um, aversion um, in this case at all. You're just looking at mean expected evaluation, so it's just the same. If alpha is equal to zero, it's also just the same because you're already focusing, even with um, PC var, you're already focusing on just the worst possible thing that can happen in every place. So there's no distribution effect. But now for other values of alpha, um, first of all, we never connect the different levels of alpha. You never you know, think that because I've been unlucky, I'm now going to be lucky in the future. But also because we have this nested version where we, we get um, uh, uh, an increasing degree of risk aversion as, um, for, for the, um, uh, as you go multiple steps. So now for 0 0.05, you can see that NC var is much more risk averse in terms of its evaluation than PC var. And similarly, for all the other values of risk pre of this risk preference, where now again you're um, you're uh, imagining these uh, nasty things that these these effectively these nasty things that can happen as you go, but it's more nasty in the context of NCVAR because you keep on reweighting the risk sensitivity as you go, so you keep on focusing on these worst and worst possible outcomes. If we look at the um, optimal policy now for NCVAR, shown on the right, this again is the PCVAR optimal policy, this is the NCVAR optimal policy. Um, you can see that it, uh, um, it, again, the values of this policy are significantly worse than the values of PCVAR. In this instance, of course, there's not much you can do. I'm either going left here or going right. And so here you can see that um, essentially you go, you're again tending to go right at these locations except right at the top. However, the values that you, comp that you compute are much worse under NCVAR because you're much more worried about the, about the risk um, aversion that can happen. And so, we've, and so that's why when we, we, we designed our environments, not only to distinguish different values of alpha, but also to distinguish different values of risk aversion in that context. Okay, so a summary of the, of the main part of the talk. So here we have a sort of parametric risk avoidant behavior where the parameter is this alpha. And with this pre-committed PC var, we have this gambler's fallacy. But of course, we've also bought ourselves a rather complicated inference where we have to think about revaluing our, our risk preference. We have to build this two-dimensional uh, policy where we have this extra dimension of um, this alpha value here too. It's worth noting that in, um, in, in other ways of thinking about sequential decision-making problems, even things like regular mean variance control, which is to say you think of a value as being the mean plus beta times the variance or minus beta times the variance. So that means that then you're, you're worried about um, excess variance that then decreases the, utility, the subjective utility. And in that case, if you want to compute that on paths, you also have to um, maintain not just one variable, but two variables, because you have to maintain both, let's, for instance, the, uh, the summed return and the summed of the squares of the return as you go. So this idea that you need an extra dimension is fairly common. In CVAR, the extra dimension is a very good extra dimension to have because it comes along with this, coherent, um, this coherence, which means that you have these good axiomatic properties. With this nested CVAR, you have this rather excessive risk aversion. Um, and uh, the benefit is you, you could choose to pro solve the problem with just one single value of alpha, and that would be fine. But if, for instance, something you know, spooked you and you wanted to change the value of alpha, then you'd need to, of course, solve the problem differently for different values of alpha. If we come back to my computational psychiatry plot in the first case, so the wrong problem you meant, if you remember, that's the case where something about the likelihoods or the priors or the components of your utility function are incorrect relative to you at other times or relative to society. And it's clear that if you have a very high value of alpha, so you have a value, very risk averse value of alpha, very near to zero, then that sort of could, could lead to something which looks a bit like pathological avoidance. And if you are a, a sort of person who employs NCVAR rather than PCVAR, and that's going to make that outcome even worse because you have this excess risk aversion, as I mentioned. In stochastic problems, so where, like the one I had with the lava pit, alpha is being zero leads to this sort of indifference or helplessness. It just doesn't matter what you do. You're always evaluating uh, the system as if the worst is always going to happen. 
Okay, so that's um, online behavior. What about planning? So here, when we, the way that we solve these problems in general is to use a form of model-based reinforcement learning. So Monte Carlo tree search, for those of you who know it, is a, you know, or, or some other way of solving for this, uh, for solving the dynamic uh, program. There are some uh, essentially equivalent Bellman equations in this, with it, which allow for this probabilistic reweighting. There's a sort of almost like game theoretic version of that that I haven't got time to go into. But there's a lot of ideas these days in the community but maybe what uh, uh, um, uh, humans and perhaps animals also do, or animals and, and perhaps humans too, is to do offline processing, whereby during times that they're not actively in involved in moving in the world, so during quiet wakefulness, during sleep, during grooming, during eating, then we have a sort of coordinated replay between the hippocampus and the cortex. And that can be used for a variety of computational operations. And the operation that we're going to look at is where you're essentially inverting a model of the world. So in a, a dynamic programming and a reinforcement learning problem, the model of the world says, I'm at this location, I go, go you know, what's the transition structure and the reward structure. And the inverse of that is a policy. It's what I should do if you put me in that, in that state. And so we can think of offline processing as taking something that you've learned about the world, i.e. the world model, maybe stored in somewhere like the hippocampus, and then using it to generate an appropriate policy that you can then run offline, uh, run online when you need it. As I mentioned, there's evidence in rodents and these days also in humans for the operation of these sorts of replay processes themselves. So an old idea from the 90s by Rich Sutton, this, uh, an algorithm called Dyna, was that you should have these sorts of, something a bit like this sort of replay process. And he used it to enable exploration. The idea is that when you're, you know, if the world has changed, you might need to plan to get to a part of the world where this, this has changed. Um, we're actually working on a form of replay that looks at that, but the, but the uh, most common form of um, analysis of replay comes from a lovely paper from Marcelo Massa and Nathaniel Dorr, which relates, in fact, to something which is an earlier idea from Andrew Moore in the, um, in, the, uh, um, in the 90s called prioritized sweeping, in which you imagine that animals, when they learn something, they're trying to do this optimal inversion of, their, of, their, of what they've learned. And then the replay processes are the instrument of that. Right? They're helping change your policy or change your, 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 the, your, the way that you evaluate actions in the world. And they say, let's imagine that the animal can do them in the optimal order. So I want to make the first um, replay should have the best effect on changing my policy. The second replay should have the, the next best effect and so forth. And so you can understand the sequence of replay events as trying to optimize the, um, the, the, the quality of the inversion of the policy. What matter and door show is that then what well, we you should do that in the um, based on the product of two terms, one called gain, one called need. Gain says if you were to do an update at some part of the maze, how or some part of the problem, how much would you change your policy? There's no point in doing a replay if the policy is not going to change. And need says, well, how frequently you, are you likely to be in that state such that it's worth your while to have updated the policy at that location? So what we can do is to do the same thing, but now ask, if you imagine you're in a world, this, uh, this random walk world, and you're trying to work out the policy. And let's say that you know you're at the start state, you know there's a reward here and a reward here and the lava pit here, and that's all you know. And then for different values of alpha, we can ask, where do you, where do you, um, uh, where do you apply your replays and what's the consequence of those replays? And what you see is that for alpha equals um, one, you do your replays in this sequence, one, two, three, four, five. So you start out at this location, which is the optimum. Remember, the optimal policy for alpha equals one is to start here and go in this direction. And indeed, you spend most of your, of your replays thinking about you know, the, the way of getting to that, that location itself. And then if alpha is, is, a, is a value like 0 0.05, you spend your replays worrying about the, about the nasty lava pit and worrying about how you can get away from the nasty lava pit, given that's all you know. And then at alpha equals zero, as I mentioned, it doesn't matter what you do. And so you have no reason to do any replays at all because you don't expect to be able to change your fate in the world is set and determined by this nasty outcome that you have. Um, in another uh, domain here, where you have a start state, um, this location, there's just a single lava pit. We can again look at what happens to prioritization in this NCVAR world based on the value of, based on being risk neutral. What well, that turns out to do, it spends one step, you know, working out how, you know, just one little step trying to get away from the goal. And then it spends the rest of its replays essentially designing an optimum policy 
to get from the reward here, get from the start state to the reward. And this is very reminiscent, for those of you who know it, of prioritized sweeping, where when you, you know there's something you don't know in the world, you get chains of actions back from the um, from the uh, goal state to the start state, or to, from a good state to the start state, and you get these sort of replays going backwards in in, um, in in the environment. And indeed, there's some evidence in the hippocampal world that this is something a little bit like what happens. But if you are risk averse, so here you have this alpha value is, is just 0.1, so you only care about this C, you know, this NC var in this bottom 10%. You can see that you spend all your um, replay events, essentially ruminating, worrying about how am I going to avoid getting caught by this awful lava pit? And you spend none of them working out how to get to the reward. And so we think of this as being an interesting way of thinking about the consequence of, uh, of, um, of, uh, uh, of, of risk aversion in the context of things like rumination um, or, or, um, or, or other anxiety conditions in which you're worried about the nasty outcomes that can happen. And in fact, when we are modeling, I haven't got time to go into it, but when we're modeling the mice in this in that environment that uh, that um, that I showed you for Mitsuko Yoshida, where they were you know, they they become avoidant of that um, of that object, we think of that as happening in this rather interesting defensive hierarchy that has been used to characterize animal behavior in the in the context of potential threat. So here you have safety pre-encounter threat. That's when you when there's you're in a somewhat threatening environment, but you haven't seen the predator yet. Post-encounter threat, which is where you see the predator, but the predator hasn't seen you, or at least isn't running after you. And then circa threat, strike threat, which is where the predator is actually running after you itself. And the idea is that during these safe states and the pre-encounter states, you're doing replays of the sort that I described in order to generate a good quality policy that you could use if nasty things happen, post-encounter threat or circa site threat. And then these that gives you a sort of way of thinking about the context of planning in this environment. So let me know to go through that. You get different sorts of anxiety there. Okay, so let me just uh, uh, sum up since I'm just about out of time. So, um, as I mentioned, we have we think about the wrong problem. And here we have, essentially, from an optimal point of view, if your value of alpha is very low, we get this sort of dysfunctional avoidance because you're trying to, you know, you're just worrying constantly about the lava pits or the, or the nasty things that can happen in the world. And then you also, through this rehearsal mechanism, have rumination because you're worried about those, you know, you're spending your, your time worrying about those locations in the world that come from having a low alpha or having N C bar rather than P C bar. And then you get this helplessness, this learned helplessness um, or action indifference from alpha near to zero because there's nothing you can do to mitigate the problem. You could imagine, you could say, well, how much of this replay should I do? And so there's a sort of meta control, an interesting meta control parameter that says how much worth, how well worthwhile does a does an update have to be for me to engage in it in a replay? And of course, then CVAR will help you know, control what that what that looks like from the, from the possibility. And then one major problem that we have that we're sort of that we're thinking about at the moment um, in in terms of formalizing is that you know we live in very complicated worlds, and so in the Bayesian in the sort of non-parametric Bayesian community, people use these these you know, non-parametric Bayesian models like Chinese restaurant processes or Indian buffet processes to characterize what the what the nature of the world might might be. But if you are planning, but if you have think about the stochasticity and the possibilities in a world like that, in a sense, there's always another catastrophe around the corner. Because we're smart enough to imagine all those horrible things that might happen as you're, you know, as, as we operate through, operate through the world. So if you have a very low value of alpha, if your alpha is near to zero, then the fact that we live in these complicated worlds mean that we're going to be highly risk of risk averse and therefore very you know, behaviorally inert in these environments. And of course, one could also think about uh, issues of risk in the exploration case, where you know the dangers of you know falling off a cliff and not being able to recover, of course, are very very salient. Um, another way I should say about thinking about risk sensitivity is you want to be robustness to miss you want to be robust to miss specification of an environment and there's a nice um, relationship between those two that you might that you can uh, imagine. In terms of the wrong solution, that's where you're trying to solve the right problem, but you're but you're you're solving it incompetently. One um, uh, issue we think is particularly relevant here, from a again from a psychiatric point of view, is that maybe you're ruminating. But the idea of the lava pit is so averse that you never quite consummate the generation of the policy that you would need as a result of that rumination. And there's some evidence there's a sort of serotonergic, so, so the neuromodulated serotonin, which is you know, famously involved in depression through SSRIs, is involved in a sort of um, behavioral inhibition. 
So we would be we would refuse to engage with um, essentially unpleasant outcomes or unpleasant thoughts themselves. And so you could imagine that because of something like the, the effect of serotonin, you don't consummate the change in the policy that you would need. And that means if you don't do that, then when you next then generate another replay, you're going to regenerate another replay to exactly the same place. So you've never actually effectively yet generated the policy that avoids it. So this is a sort of, we call this a sort of Pavlovian misbehavior, but associated with your own choices in the head as opposed to actual choices in the world. Um, another thing you could have is you could be trying to be a PC VAR agent, which is a bit less risk averse, but maybe you have an incomplete adjustment for luck. And so you can imagine a sort of continu continuous process all the way towards NC VAR itself. And in terms of the wrong environment, so this is the case where you're trying to solve the problem correctly, but, something, uh, but, the, but the distribution is, is wrong. One interesting context for this is in depression, we know that uh, subjects essentially have this tendency to overgeneralize. So as if they've learned a, you know, the statistics of the environment, they think that what they learn in one place also applies in other places. And that can be normative in given, given aspects of different sorts of environments. What that means is that small amounts of risk in one place can infect other parts of the state space and thereby have a dramatic effect on changing what you're going to be willing to do in these contexts. So just to sum up, I think that um, CVAR is a really nice way of thinking about uh, risk in the sequential context. And you get lots of these interesting rich behaviors that come out. And so we're very excited now to try some of these, in, these maps on our hapless uh, subjects to see how they, how they uh, operate risk in different ways and then tie it together to aspects of their psychiatric conditions. So thank you very much. Here, yeah. this is the example. These are now. Bit bigger one, which I stopped sharing my screen. So, yes, so you can then see me. And let me stop sharing. So you can see the audio. Okay. Hi. Nice Hi. to see you. <laughs> Sorry, I should have done it before. <laughs> Thank That's you very okay. much. Um, so, um, waiting for other people to ask questions. I have uh, a few questions about the. Uh, first, the definition of uh, risk. So it mm -hmm. seems like uh, the way you define risk, you also miss a lot of opportunities and that you never look at. Is there any way to define risk in a way that sort of accounts for being risk aversive, but, you know, proportionally to how much opportunities you are giving up? Yes, you could imagine. So another way of thinking about another sort of risk measures, say, I want to maximize my returns subject to a certain um, minimum, a certain maximum um, chance of dying, for instance, something right. like that. So you can imagine. And so that's an, a different sort of risk evaluation. And I think what you do, so that, you know, it wouldn't, it's not, wouldn't be exactly what I've talked about, but it would have some of the very similar constraints. You'd have to worry about how you know, your chance of dying on a path. So you would say, okay, when I take this path, I'm going to accumulate my chance of dying along that path. And then apart from that, I'm going to maximize the choices I do. So I don't think that the calculations would be quite as neat as they are for CVAR, for, for PCVAR, as I talked about. But it's certainly a very coherent way of thinking about risk. And it's quite common in the, in the dynamic, in the um, RL world, people have thought about safety in RL in, 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 right. in exactly that context. But it, you know, it's an interesting question, you know, what, you know, what risk measure we should, we should use, like how, how risk averse we should be. And I think it's not, it's not you know, how we should go about being risk averse. And I do it also risk seeking. We could of course look at the upper tail rather than the lower tail. And so we're just quite intrigued to see what, uh, what, what people do and then could think about fitting different models to their risk preferences. Right, and also the, then how, you know, is, is there any way to infer what is the definition of risk for animals or for? Yeah, exactly. So what we try, try to do is for, for our human subjects, we design those maps so that if they were using something like PC bar, then we can see which of the paths they take, right? So if, you're, if you take the risk, the, the, the very risk, what looks like the very risky path, the very direct path, then that means that your alpha, we can bound your alpha value, for instance. We've done the, um, and then for the mice, where we have those, um, those, uh, those, you know, there were some mice that were very willing, unwilling to ever go anywhere near to the object and others were not. Then again, we can, um, we can use risk uh, aversion to characterize that. One trouble in that domain is that uh, we don't know what the priors are of the mice. So as you can imagine, there's a, there's, a, there's a problem of identifiability, which is you could have a prior, and this relates to the wrong environment versus the wrong, well, versus the wrong problem. You could have a very low value of alpha, or you could have a very, um, a very um, 
harmful prior. And either of those two would lead to the sort of risk aversive behavior that, you, that you're seeing. And one other thing we're doing at the moment, actually, is, is to, since large language models are the rage, is we're thinking about um, uh, how if we can uh, if we can evaluate the sentiment associated with language. So that if people say sentences, we can work out what their sentiment is. We can ask essentially what distribution we can use the same CVAR measures essentially to ask you know what uh, target of distribute how how are people generating language associated with. Um, expectations of different sentiment values at the end, right? So here, it's a way of thinking about quantiles of distributions. And so language also has, can, can, can be attached to these different alphas in terms of, say, the sentiment of sentences. We can use the same ideas to think about how we can reverse engineer how people are, are reporting the world in their, in their, in their um, using the same cvr like measures as, as in that context too. Thank you. Uh, during the talk, there is the you said that there is a a way to define risk aversion in a way that's uh, kind of kosher from some point of view, uh, yes. which I don't think you you told us about. Is there yeah. so? So I imagine there's a lot of redundancy in the way you define both the uh, you know the rewards and the risk aversion, and and so it's what are the what's the rationale? Are there any constraints on yeah, so the so what makes so so given a set of returns, a risk when you have a risk, you just want to say, well, how am I going to go about evaluating the distribution? I have a distribution of possible returns. How am I going to evaluate that? And so you could have the mean value is one way. You could have something like the mean minus something times the variance. That would be another way, and so forth. There are a number of ways like that. And the axioms that were defined by, for instance, by Artsner about what counts as a coherent risk measure, you no, know, they're just the obvious things you would have. Which if you have a like a deterministic if you know um, a transform of a set of returns, you want to you, know, you should evaluate it with the same deterministic um, uh, effect. If you shift all the returns up, you want to have that be the, the that change too. And the one which is difficult for measures like the VAR or the mean variance one, the one they don't satisfy, says that if we essentially um, uh, diversify our risk, we, you know, so like you diversify your assets, you have you know, like two risky things, then you want that the risk of the combined asset should be uh, uh, at least lower or, or at least the same or most the same as the risk of the individual outcomes because you've essentially done, you know, like the chance of two nasty things happening should be less. And measures like the, 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 the value at risk don't satisfy that, which is why they're not coherent risk measures. But the CVAR measure that I talked about does satisfy that. And that's why it is a coherent risk measure. And so it's the sort of risk measure that's a good idea to use for doing these sorts of, um, these sorts of calculations. Are there more questions? Because I can keep going, but... <laughs> uh, it's like it's too risky to ask me a question. Don't worry. I don't bite. I have no lava pits. At least I'm far away from my lava. There's nowhere nearby. Well, I'll ask one more question. Okay. Uh, but you people think. Um, so uh, one other curiosity I had was, uh, as you define risk as a sort of like the average of the tail of the distribution, I imagine this is harder to evaluate and I imagine any algorithm which corrects any kind of policy will take longer to converge. So isn't that also a kind of risk that one should take into account? Like uh, I want to be uh, to, to avoid risk, but in order to evaluate a better policy, actually make more mistakes for longer. Is there any way to account for, you know, how fast convergence right. is? Great question. So we haven't looked at, at, um, at convergence, but this path dependence I was talking about really affects that. And so when we are when we are modeling the mice in their environment, so there what we imagine is that there's a hazard function for the predator. The, 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 the animals why that there might be a predator lurking nearby the new object, and it's like a water hole. They're sort of waiting for them to go there, and then at some time the predator will wake up and gobble them up. So. In that case, we have a temporal hazard function, which says how, um, which, which, uh, which the animal doesn't know. And so the animal has an, has an incentive to go visit the object because it wants to, you know, it's curious about it, it can consume curiosity reward or exploration bonus, an exploration bonus for it. But if it thinks that the predator is going to wake up and it stays there too long, then it has an incentive to return quickly back to the nest, you know, like some safe, some safe space that we sort of model in this environment. And of course, if you think that the predator you know, it might wake up uh, at, at some later point, you have an incentive because you're risk averse, which is not to stay there long enough to find out whether that's true or not. 
if you, you know the way you would collect data is extremely expensive to you, right? You get gobbled up by the by the evil predator. So that's a really nice case of where you then you know your risk aversion has this sort of path dependent effect on you, and you're unwilling to go and invest it. And that's why we think the the more risk averse animals are so unwilling ever to engage properly with the object. Whereas the more risk seeking or risk neutral animals, they don't have a problem. They just go there and they never get gobbled up. And so, so I was re- we were really surprised by the degree of um, difference between the different animals in that context. But you're quite right that explore- risk sensitive exploration is really, really difficult because there's always you know, something nasty that could happen and you just don't know enough about it. And so, you know, humans show lots of ambiguity aversion, right? So second order probability aversion, when you don't know what the probability is of something nasty might happen, then um, you know, we are very averse to, to taking risks in those cases. And in the sequential problem, that gets even worse, where you have to collect your own data that then you, you don't see. And most of finance hasn't really looked, or most of the psychology community has tended to look at one-shot problems where you just have a single bandit, and you say, or a single, you know, like a, like a pie chart with different outcomes. And it's in the sequential case, it becomes much more interesting and much richer. Um, are there more questions? I ask all of the questions. <laughs> Nobody does. Well, thank you very much indeed. I really appreciate the chance to talk Thanks, to you. Thanks, Peter. Sorry for not having you, but next time uh, in person. <laughs>